Welcome to Make Me Care About You Guys. This is a good one. One that I was really looking forward to because I don't know what image comes to your mind when you hear the word surveillance, but I thought, is this, is someone spying on us? And so I was super looking forward to having this conversation. And I can tell you with confidence, no one is spying you. Created in partnership with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, this is Make Me Care About. I'm Jen Hatmaker, and with me is Supriya Kumar, a program officer working on infectious disease surveillance at the Gates Foundation. I am just, I'm delighted to meet you. You're a, such a fascinating person. Your work is so interesting and specific. So I am um, a molecular biologist by training and then retrained in public health. And what I do at the foundation is really focus on infectious disease surveillance. And so there's many ways to do infectious disease surveillance. And typically, you would rely on somebody who has symptoms of a disease to come into a clinic and then be tested by a healthcare professional. And that's great. I think that is absolutely important. And tell us, what are other ways to conduct disease surveillance? How many kinds of surveillance can there really be? There's new methods that are being developed that allow us to also look at what is going around in a community's wastewater. And what I mean by that is that we're realizing that a lot of these diseases that are caused by specific pathogens, those bugs, pathogens, are also shed by humans who are infected. And by shed, I mean, you know, when you poop, you actually send some of that pathogen out into the sewer. And so even if you didn't go into a clinic, you would be able to understand what bugs are transmitting in the community by looking at what's going around in sewage. Mm -hmm. And so that is what wastewater surveillance is. Mm -hmm. So why should we care about this? Like, what is potentially at stake if we don't pay attention to wastewater? Yeah, there's two aspects to this. One is if you do rely on people going into the doctor for us to be able to capture, you know, these diseases in our surveillance systems, you are going to miss a piece of the picture because mm. there are populations that are weary of accessing healthcare. There are populations that simply don't have access and so cannot go in and access healthcare. And so you're going to only see a biased picture in your surveillance system unless you have this kind of, you know, method that is independent of human behavior. I think it gives people sort of situational awareness and uh, important information that might not be available through a traditional healthcare-based surveillance mm -hmm. system. And this sort of ties into the second point, which is equity. Mm. Because you're able to have a picture of populations that don't have access to healthcare, you do have a, a more equitable surveillance system with wastewater surveillance. And that's both at our level in cities, where you mm. now have a picture of populations that are not going into healthcare settings, but also on a global scale. Mm. And so having lower cost methods such as this can be really key. Can you give us an example of what kind of diseases scientists have found as a result of wastewater surveillance in the U.S.? You know, there was a story from last year of polio virus being picked up in the mm. New York City sewers. And that brought polio environmental surveillance, which, you know, we think about and do a lot of globally, really close to home. And more, you know, more routinely, I guess, the United States did fund and do a lot of SARS-CoV-2 environmental surveillance mm. during the pandemic. And originally during the pandemic, we really wanted to understand, does a community have SARS-CoV-2, right? It was very early days and you didn't even know if it had spread everywhere. And so wastewater surveillance gave you an early picture. As you progressed through the pandemic, it became an early warning system. And the United States has, you know, quickly become really quite a leader in this space. Mm. The CDC has taken up wastewater surveillance in many counties around the country. So, for example, influenza, you know, we know spread seasonally mm. in the United States yeah. and it does mutate routinely. And so by looking at wastewater, you can start to get 
a picture of the, the, the particular virus going around in a given year. That's so interesting. Could you drill down one more layer and just explain to us how scientists like you actually surveil wastewater? Walk us through the process. It's the exciting art of going and picking up sewage. <laughs> I mean, that's what it sounds like. <laughs> no, seriously. So, you know, there are many ways to do it, of course, and it all depends on the context. So in high resource settings, there are sometimes, you know, robots that are used. So you can have a little robot that sits in a sewer and sips. I mean, that is really the term that is used. Oh my. It sips sewage every once in a while. So you have sort of a little bit of sewage that is picked up every once in a while over a day. And so for that 24-hour period, you can have a composite sample. And then you can look at all the pathogens that, that you find in that. That's sort of the most hands-off approach. Okay. But even so, you need to go and pick up the sample from that robot, take it to a lab, and then extract the information that you want to find over there. The more hands-on method, which is done even in the, in the United States and in high resource settings, is to go and actually pick up like a bucket of sewage and then take it back to the lab. In lower resource settings, it is typically either the bucket approach or there are extremely low-cost methods that are very efficient, well, that act very much like that sipping robot. But essentially what you're doing is take a gauze, a piece of gauze, tie it up and put it in your sewer for 24 hours. Okay. And so as the sewage flows through it, your pathogens are sort of captured in this gauze material. And then you can go back after 24 hours or 48 hours, pick up that gauze, bring it back to your lab and assay it. So there are various methods you can use based on the context and how much money you have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. um, but that's sort of the approach that's taken to actually sampling your wastewater or sewage uh -huh. or septage system. I think it's going to take me a solid week to get over the phrase sipping sewage. Just give me some time. <laughs> give me a minute. I'll get there, but it will not be quick. So... Let me ask you this. What are some, or maybe are there other, surprising places that we wouldn't necessarily register as places to track viruses outside of that sort of obvious space? Yeah, I mean, we get on an aircraft, we're not necessarily thinking, you know, what is what a collection on the, the aircraft? Or, yeah. But it is interesting, you know, most of these, Boeing and Airbus aircraft will have your know, three wastewater collection um, tank. And you can look in those tanks to see what are people, you know, on this flight shedding, right? Mm. But along the same lines, I think there are other transportation networks. You know, in many countries, it's not aircraft that most people would travel on. For example, there are countries right now that are thinking about, you know, doing some surveillance on in border towns because that's where migrants are going back and forth. And you might be able to get an early warning of mm -hmm. a pathogen either coming in or going out. During the pandemic, what became quite useful was the ability to also surveil at uh, university dorms. Because, oh. you know, surveillance of mm -hmm. wastewater was such an early warning system, especially in those kinds of closed settings where you might know who all live in this place. And as soon as you pick up a signal of a pathogen, you have an intervention like, you know, you can increase either individual based testing or you can increase vaccination. Um, you know, that that became really powerful. This is Make Me Care About. I'm Jen Hatmaker, and with me today is Supriya Kumar. She is a wastewater surveillance expert and public health researcher at the Gates Foundation. You guys, today, Supriya is telling us all about the power of wastewater surveillance. So, I mean, I don't know about you, but I can tell you, I'll never forget the term sipping sewage again. So don't tell us we never taught you anything around here, okay? In the second half of this conversation, we've got some really cool stuff. Sapria is going to talk to us about barriers to wastewater surveillance that exist in other countries, what people like me and you can do about any of this, and also the future of pandemic preparedness. What have we learned and what might we get better next time? Thank you. 
Hi, my name is Padmini Shrikantaya. I'm a deputy director working on the pneumonia and pandemic preparedness team at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I started working on infectious diseases in public health more than 20 years ago. Part of my job then was taking care of patients with HIV in San Francisco and Uganda. A keen to understand infectious diseases is not just a product of pathogens, but also a reflection of social inequities. Where someone is born is often key to determining their health outcomes. My work at the foundation is dedicated to erasing this inequity. I focus on respiratory syncytial virus. You might know that as RSV. There will soon be efficacious vaccines that can help prevent RSV disease. Our work at the foundation is focused on making sure these innovations and in vaccines are accessible to vulnerable infants in low and middle income countries as soon as possible. If you're enjoying this episode and wanna learn more about the amazing work of our partners, Visit us at gatesfoundation.org and sign up for our newsletter, The Optimist. This is Make Me Care About. I'm Jen Hatmaker, and with me today is Sapriya Kumar. She is a wastewater surveillance expert and public health researcher at the Gates Foundation. So, Bill Gates wrote an op-ed in the New York Times recently, and I'm just going to paraphrase. He basically said, imagine that you are in your home and you have a little kitchen fire. And so several things are in place to solve this. First of all, your fire alarm goes off. Somebody calls 911. That's in place. You reach under your cabinet and you grab a fire extinguisher and you start working on it, that's another precaution that you have, like, ready to go. If that doesn't work, we've talked about this a million times, you know how to safely evacuate. By the time you guys get outside, there's a fire truck, there are firemen, there is a water hose, they know where to hook it up, they use the hydrant. And just like that, the fire's put out of your home before it affects your neighbors or the whole street. So he goes on to use that analogy to say that we need to prepare to fight disease outbreaks in the same way, meaning we need to have a bunch of systems in place that are universal and ubiquitous because with a pandemic, it starts in one home, as the analogy goes, but it very quickly spreads to the whole street and then the whole neighborhood. Is this how you think in terms of wastewater surveillance on a global scale? I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think it's both. So you do need that global networked approach and people need to see the value of that for their country. I mean, you need countries to be bought into that system together and know that they will reap the benefits of whatever comes out of it. So think about, for example, if the next pandemic potential pathogen came out of a low resource setting, mm -hmm. a setting somewhere in Africa or South Asia, these countries may not necessarily have the resources to undertake wide-scale surveillance or even know which part of their country this has arisen in. Mm. And so by undertaking aircraft wastewater surveillance, if a country like the United States saw there's this pathogen that's arisen in some small country, what do we do about that? I mean, you know, I hope that we will be, <laughs> by the time the next pandemic comes around, and it will come around, I hope we'll be at a stage where we don't have to just shut air travel down and close off that country. I hope we'll yeah. be at a place where the world is willing to say, oh, it's coming from this country. Let us see how we can help that country deal with it. How can we increase surveillance in that country? How can we make sure that whatever vaccines are made are actually available to that country and early? What are the primary barriers for a lower resource country or community to say, we simply can't do this? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. The first step in you know, setting up this kind of surveillance system in a lower resource setting is in fact estimating the number of people that are represented in a sample oh. that you take from that river. And that itself takes a lot of resources, right? more resources than it takes to simply get that quick information from the wastewater treatment plant in the United States. And the pathogens that are of interest in a low resource setting might be quite different from what are of interest here. So mm. here people are 
interested in a lot of influenza and SARS-CoV-2. In lower resource settings, there was often an interest in things like cholera, in typhoid, of course, polio. Um, Mm -hmm. So there's also sort of a a challenge in coming up with the tools to look for those pathogens of interest. And if those tools are significantly different from what is of interest in higher resource settings, those tools need to be developed. As a global community, we would do very well if we all collaborated on developing those tools. Because who's to say when those pathogens won't hit our shores? So using the analogy... And knowing what you're teaching us about the immense value of wastewater surveillance, everyday people like us who aren't in your line of work, is there anything that we can do to support the firefighters, such as the analogy goes, who would work together to sort of snuff out the spread of another pandemic? Yes. You know, I like to to think about wastewater surveillance as in some ways, democratizing the the availability and use of data. It gives us, I think, as people in these communities, the power to take health into our own hands and Mm. to really change our own behavior based on what we're seeing in wastewater. I can decide to wear a mask for the next week if I see increasing trends in my community. I can decide to work from home for the next week if I'm able to, if I'm in a position to do that, and if I see that that would be useful in my community. So I think in a way, Mm. we as everyday people with wastewater surveillance are more powerful. Given that knowledge, I think we could also advocate for more wastewater surveillance and advocate for more funding for wastewater surveillance. More broadly, I think at the global level, it's a very powerful method. And so keeping track of what people are doing with it is also very important. Mm. You know, with a powerful method comes, of course, the potential for it to be misused. For example, we at the foundation and in public health generally would like to keep this method be focused on public health use. We would like public health authorities to have access to these data and for the public to have access to these data. But it is not outside the realm of imagination for companies to start surveilling their effluent systems to try and understand what's going around in your employees. Wow. So I think that we need to keep track of also the ethics of Mm -hmm. how this is done and managed. And it's on all of us to do that. What do you think your work can teach us about future pandemics? You know, there are many ways that it could be useful. Mm -hmm. Um, the, The most sort of top of mind, I think, from the COVID experience is this early warning system. Yeah. There is also, in parts of the world, there are no diagnostics that are used for some pathogens. And so you don't even know if that pathogen is a problem in your community or in your country. And when there are vaccines that are available that can really improve the quality of life of people, you want country policymakers to know whether that disease is a problem or not. So, you know, we can develop the tools to actually understand, and these will be lower cost tools than actually doing diagnostics in individual. So we're doing this, for example, for typhoid in various parts of Africa and Asia. And then there is also genomics. So understanding not only if a pathogen is present or not, but also exactly what form it's taken. So, you know, we're hearing a lot about avian flu of late. And it has started to really spread in wild birds, and it has already started to jump over into mammals. But really starting to understand, you know, what what form is that virus taking? How is it evolving? How is it starting to adapt more to humans or not is really Mm -hmm. useful. And we do have the tools to use wastewater surveillance in that way as well. Hmm. What would you love to see in a best case scenario as you look to the future of wastewater surveillance? I would love to see the world be a bit more coordinated Hmm. and come together, really. You know, when you think about healthcare systems being as varied as they are around the world and people's access to healthcare being, you know, as variable as it is, developing a global early warning system is not an easy task. But I think the potential exists with wastewater surveillance, and so it is hopeful. Um, And that is going to take not only funding, 
but also the willingness for partners to work together, um, funders to work together, academics to work together, as well as practitioners and people who are you know, on the ground. And there you are out there on the front lines, leading the way. That's exciting. And I hope that in 10 years, if you and I hopped back on the phone again, that we will have seen some big strides forward oh, in yes. all the ways that you just mentioned. I really would love to see that in our lifetime, knowing that this could be incredibly preventative for another pandemic. It's a huge deal. And this is a huge yeah. day. So thank you so much, Sapria, for being here today. And um, you officially made me care about wastewater surveillance and you taught me the invaluable phrase of sewage sipping. <laughs> Who else could do it but you? You, you <laughs> did go, it. Jen. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. Thank you. It's interesting. I'm walking away from this conversation feeling strangely hopeful and realizing that we really are truly connected globally and that we matter to each other, that we belong to one another. And so I hope that the next time Sapria and I talk, that the world looks a little bit different, a little bit better than it did today. If you are interested in learning more about Sapria's work, you guys check out the show notes. Make Me Care About is produced by Jesse Baker and Eric Newsom of Magnificent Noise. Our production staff includes Sabrina Farhi, Hewate Gatana, Julia Nat, and Kristen Muller. Our executive producer is Eric Newsom, and I'm your host, Jen Hatmaker. Hold up. 